Hey, what's up, church? Man, good morning. What's up, everybody online? We're pumped that you're here today. Man, I think today is going to be a good day. Hey, before we start rolling, I want us to be reminded that when we sing, our God hears us today. And not only does he listen, not only does he hear us, when we sing, when we lift our voice and set our attention on him, I believe that our faith grows. And I believe that our perspective changes. Man, I believe that it is worth it to sing today. So we're going to start off with a song that we started singing last week. It comes out of the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 81. It's called Honey in the Rock. And that might sound strange to you today, but what we're saying with this song is that our God can and will provide even when the circumstances just seem so unlikely. He can even bring honey out of a rock. Isn't that crazy? So we believe it today. We want our faith to grow today. So let's all sing together. Start off strong. The chorus goes like this. Come on. This honey in the rock, water in the stone, man on the ground, no matter where I go, I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need, you've got this honey in the rock. Yeah. Praying for a miracle, thirsty for the living word. Only you can satisfy yeah. Sweetness at the mercy seat Now I taste it It's not hard to see yeah. Only you can satisfy Yeah, come on, sing The sunny in the rock The sunny in the rock Sunny in the rock, sunny in the rock. Freedom, where the spirit is, bounty in the wilderness. Only you can satisfy. Yeah, come on. The sunny in the rock, water in the stone, and on the ground, no matter. Come on, we believe it today. Everything you did is enough, Jesus. We believe that he's on our side, that he's working on our behalf, and that our God can provide in any season, in any circumstance. Come on, let's sing. No, I keep looking and I keep finding. You keep giving, you keep providing. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. Oh, I keep praying, and you keep moving. I keep praising, and you keep proving. I have all that I need. Yeah. You are all that I need. Come on, sing it again. Oh, I keep looking, and I keep finding. Keep on giving, you keep providing. I have all that I need. Yeah. You Sweet, how sweet it is to teach. 
trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Yeah, I mean, anybody thankful for Jesus today? Yeah, amen. to hear is the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises, he hears me. Yeah, he hears us today. He hears us today. I'll sing it again. There is a sound. There is a sound. I love to hear it's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith. Come on, let him hear your faith today. Let your voices rise to our God today. Come on, church, let's lift him up. Sing, Awake My Soul. Awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Come on, sing his praise today. Awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. sound that changes things, the sound of his people on their knees. Oh, wake up, you celebrate, it's time to worship him. Oh, wake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Come on, lift your voice, sing his praise aloud. Oh, wake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. And when he moves, and when we pray, what stood a wall now stands away, where every promise is a name. No mistake, but the bowels of hell begin to shake. Oh, hell, the Lord, oh, hell, the King. Hey, oh, oh, let the King of glory enter in. Hey, oh, fall down on your knees and worship Him. How great the chasm 
that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to air and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, yeah. the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living. Such boundless grace, the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, and I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls. Sing it out. Declare it. Then came the morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. No very body began to breathe. And now. Oh, 
sing this chorus one more time. Lift it up. Let the voices rise around us. Let's sing it loud. We sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. the one who set me free. Sing hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, my living hope. One last time, we sing. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's thank Him today. Come on, Amen. Good morning, church. So good to worship with you guys. If you're in the room, you can go ahead and take a seat. You can grab out your communion that you got on your way in. And if you're joining us online today, we're so glad you're here. Go ahead and grab whatever you have to take communion with us. We're going to do that in a minute all together. But I don't know about you guys, but it's been a bit of a crazy week for me. I feel like there's been some really high highs and some really low lows. One of those things, we had our Shine Prom on Friday. If you don't know what that is, it's our special needs prom. And Sean's actually going to go into a lot more detail about that in a minute. But I'll just say this. On Friday night at both campuses, it was a rocking place. And it was an amazing, amazing time. I left here on a total high. But earlier that day, we had actually we'd had a funeral just here in this room for one of, our, one of our own, a young dad who left us way too early. And it's like, that was a, a low. And then you go into this high Saturday morning, got up, still riding the high of Friday night, and actually got a phone call. Um, and there was a plane crash that happened probably less than a half a mile from here. And I don't know all the details, don't claim to know all the details about what happened, but this is what I do know. I know that in that moment, Lives were lost in that plane crash, and lives changed in that moment forever. And so for me, this past week, weekend, there's been times and moments that I've had these even if opportunities that we've been talking about in this series. Maybe where I was like, God, I know you, I trust you, but I don't get it in this moment. Maybe it doesn't make sense, all of those things that are happening. But this, this is what we do know is true. As believers, we can trust even in those even if moments because of that song we were just singing, right? Because we have a living hope. Because 2,000 years ago, this guy named Jesus, he came here and he went to the cross for us. And that's why we take communion every single week. So I want you guys to take that cup out right now. And that cup's got some bread and some juice in it. That represents the body and the blood of Jesus, his sacrifice for us. And this is what I want you to do. You may be in a place of grief. You may be in a place of celebration today. You may be somewhere in between. But we get to celebrate. We get to remember the hope that we have in Jesus today. So I want you to take that cup, take that bread, take the juice, and then just to take a moment and remember the hope we have. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and take God, we just want to lift today up to you. God, we're thankful to just be in this place, to worship together. God, thankful for the hope that we have in you. I just, I pray today for those families that are affected by that plane crash, God. We just pray that you would give them hope, you would give them peace. God, I pray that they can feel you. And I pray, God, as we 
just listen to the message today. I pray for Sean as he speaks. And God, I just pray that you fill us with that hope, God, that we can see you in our lives despite where we might be, the grief, the highs, the lows, the celebrations, God. We're thankful for you in our lives. God, we just, we give all of these things to you today and we trust you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now at campus, how are we doing this morning? You guys good? Frederick Campus, great to have you join us live. Hope you guys are doing awesome out there. And everybody online, we love you. It's good to have you with us today, man. I, we've already referred to it, but there's been a lot going on. And I, I know the same way for you, a lot of highs, a lot of lows in life. Um, Friday night was probably one of the highest, best nights um, of our year. So if you were here, if you weren't here, you missed out. But if you were here, we had our Shine Prom, uh, annual Shine Prom. We do it every year. The last two years, we've done it at both locations. And I'm telling you guys, there is not another night anywhere that I see so much joy or as much joy as you just see it that night. Special needs families that come in, every person that is a participate, participant in this gets to be the king or the queen of the prom. We have people laughing a little bit because they're like, you change the time of the prom and you're doing it at homecoming time, not prom time. But anyways, we had a great time with it and it was so much fun to see 200 participants and to see hundreds and hundreds of volunteers from our church and from our community. It's not just volunteers from our church. We have tons of uh, first uh, of emergency responders. So our fire, firemen, our police officers, medics, all that, they're here just hanging out, being a part of the night. Our towns invest in this and give money toward it. I mean, it is just a big night. And one of the coolest things about it is we start off with a red carpet, and I love this. It's, it's so much fun, but they have a red carpet. They're the king and queen of the prom. They come running down. They've got their buddies with them, and the people who stand on the sides of the red carpet are our sports teams from our, our local high schools, so Frederick High School and Niwot High School. And one of the neatest things that happened this last week is Niwot High School's soccer team had a soccer game against Silver Creek, so two local schools right here, um, during the time of Shine Prom, like during the red carpet. And so the coach went to the athletic director, and he's like, dude, we, we can't do this. Like, we need to be a part of Shine Prom. And so they called Silver Creek's athletic director and soccer coach and said, can we change the time of the game? We'll be late. Are you all right with that? Silver Creek said yes. And at 6.30, our campus pastor here at the Niwak campus was grabbing the coach and saying, Joe, like, you guys got to go. Like, it's after 6.30. You have a game at 7. You got to get over to Niwak High School. And I just thought that was so neat just to see the participation of people saying, I want to be part of that. And here's the thing for us, we do that, why? Because our mission is to know Jesus and love like him, and we want more people to know him. And so we express our love in this way, and it's just another way that we get to reach out and introduce people to Jesus through something like the Shine Prom. And so to our staff and to our volunteers, let's just say thank you and celebrate. They did a phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal job. Okay, so before we get into the message, I got one more thing, and it's kind of along the same lines. It's a vision thing that uh, we are excited about, a new thing that's going to introduce us to more people. One of the best programs we have that introduces us to probably more people than anything else in our church is our Rocky Mountain Youth Basketball and Cheer Leagues. All right, so 10 years ago, some of you may not know this, there was 190 kids that were involved in that program. Last year, we had 1,190 kids. That's not parents, that's, not, that's just kids, not even volunteers, kids involved in that pro program. And so what we figured out is, is our team that does that, Jen Morris and her team, they do a phenomenal job at doing basketball. It's the best basketball league in Colorado for kids. And so we've taken that, we've looked at what surveys say that parents are wanting um, for their kids in our area, the number one thing in our area, but it's not just in our area. It's like in every area. This is what parents want for their kids. The number one thing is recreational and sports activities for their kids. Like get them off the iPad, get them outside, get them in the gym, and let's hang out and let's have some fun and teach them some leadership principles. And so we've taken what we do well, we've taken what parents want, and we've said we've just got to expand it. 
We're going to keep doing basketball. Jen Moyers and her team, they're going to keep doing basketball this year. But we have just this last month hired a guy named Enoch Miller, who is from our church. Super excited about that. He and his wife, Brittany, have been at our church for quite a while. And Enoch has been a teacher in our school system in the local area. He's been a teacher and a coach in Colorado at four different schools. He's won a state championship in basketball. I mean, the guy is a sports guy. And number one thing, he has a massive heart for Jesus. And so we asked Enoch, would you come on? Would you work with Jen in the basketball program, learn that? And then would you expand into other sports for us, more camps during the summer, other sports at other seasonal times for us where we just have an opportunity to reach out to more people? And so, man, I'm super excited to welcome Enoch and his family, both campuses. Let's do that. And... Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, registration's open for basketball. I want you to register your kids, sign up to coach, sign up to ref, and invite everybody you can to be a part of it. And then we're going to launch into some new things next year that are going to be fantastic. All right? Okay, here's what I want to do. I want you to get to Genesis chapter 6. And as you're getting there, think about this question. When was the last time that somebody asked you to do something that you didn't think made sense? Like all the husbands in the room are shaking their heads. Actually, all the young husbands have not learned and they may be shaking their heads, right? Here's the deal. We get asked all the time to do things that that we can't see the future so they don't always make sense to us. And we get asked in little ways that we don't even realize sometimes. So the other day, I was, I was in my car. I was heading um, to a meeting that was 45 minutes away. I was fairly familiar with where I was going. So I didn't exactly need Google Maps, but I thought, you know what? I only have 45 minutes. It's saying that it's gonna take 45 minutes. I'm gonna check Google Maps and see what the best route is. And so I just punched in the address and I took off. Now I told you I was pretty familiar with this route. I just wanted the best way. And I'm cruising down and Google Maps starts telling me, it just starts saying, hey, take a right in 1,000 feet. And I'm going, take a right in 1,000 feet. I'm familiar with this direction. Google Maps, you're stupid. Like this is not... Like, this is not the best route. This is not the fastest route. And so I blew right through the turn. And you know what your phone does, right? It it does a little spinny thing, and it says rerouting on the screen. And then it comes back, and Google Maps says, um, in 500 feet, take a U-turn. I'm like, forget you, man. I'm not taking a U-turn. I know a faster way. And I just keep busting right on through, because this is not making sense to me. And it happens, honestly, guys, it happens. I don't even know why I pulled it up. It happened like three more times. And I'm looking at this thing, I'm going, I finally like unplug my phone, you know, shut it off, and I come over the hill and I see exactly why. Because there is this new construction area, and I'm telling you, the line of cars in Erie was like a mile long. Like if you live in Erie, it is like everywhere construction. And I come over, I'm thinking, this makes no sense. I come over the hill, and it made sense. I think the biggest reason Spiritually speaking, the biggest reason that we don't reroute our direction toward God is because most of the time, the direction he gives in the moment doesn't make sense. Genesis chapter 6 is the story, like it is the story. It is the story in scripture that kind of shows us this moment of God asking somebody to do something that really doesn't make sense. You think about Noah, you think about the flood, you're like, wow, this story, I don't know if this makes sense. Build an ark, here's what's going on. Let me set a little bit of the stage for you. The context is this. There are two groups of people, the the book of Genesis says. It says there are two groups of people, they are descendants of Adam. One is the descendants of his son Seth, and they're called the sons of God. Then there is another group that is the descendants of his son Cain. We know the story of Cain and Abel. Cain killed killed Abel, he left the family, and his direction was pointed away from God. Adam and Eve have another son, his name is Seth, He's, he's directed toward God, he is a follower of God, and his descendants were called the sons of God. Well, interesting thing happens. It says the sons of God begin to intermarry with the daughters of men. It's just simple. The descendants of Seth and the descendants of Cain, one headed toward God, one headed a direction away from God, and here is the result. Verse five, chapter six, says the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. 
So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. Now let's push pause for a second, because I don't know, I don't care where you are on the spectrum or the journey of faith that you're in. At the beginning, at the end, or if you're saying, I'm not even on the journey of faith. That's a hard story. Like that's one of those stories that people just kind of step back and say, man, I don't know if I buy into this thing because of this kind of story. When you look at this story and God says, I regret that I made the human race and I am going to destroy them with a flood. Like there's actually answers to that. And we're gonna get there in a second, but, but here's the thing that I think we need to understand and it's really hard, it's difficult. I think sometimes we just need to acknowledge that God knows more than we do. And I want you to think about that for a second. If you have kids, you understand this because if you're a parent, there are things that you do with your kids that they don't understand, why? Because you just know more than they do. You have more experience in life, you've been through more in life, you, you know more than your kids do. But for some reason, your kids, they look at you and out of their like infinite experience, like out of all their life experience and wisdom that they've gained from that, they're like, no, I'm heading this direction because this doesn't make sense and I think I know a better way. And this is why at two years old, you look at your kids and you're like, hey, don't touch the stove because it's hot because you know something they don't know. It's when they're six that you say, hey, don't run out into the street. Look both ways because it's not safe. It's why you say at 17 and 19, like my two daughters are, it's why you look at them and you say, hey, make a complete stop at red lights and stop signs because you're gonna get a ticket. The other day I got an envelope. It's very interesting. I got an envelope from the city of Denver. I opened up the envelope and I pulled out a traffic violation. The city of Denver wrote on that and they sent me a picture and everything and they said, um, you rolled through a right turn on a red light and we're giving you a ticket. And I was thinking, I was like, when was the last time I was actually in Denver in that location? And so I flipped to the second page and I look at the picture and there I am, I'm driving a red Explorer. Except guys, the problem is I don't drive a red Explorer. And I look a little closer to the picture. You know how those pictures, have you ever had one of these? Uh, unfortunately, I've had one before, but I, you, you know this, like they're super grainy, the pictures, and I'm trying to look at this thing. I'm like, a Red Explorer? I don't drive a Red Explorer. And I look through the window and I realize that the person driving the Red Explorer has long blonde hair. <laughs> Guys, I don't know if you notice this, but I don't have long blonde hair. I don't even have hair, right? But my 19-year-old does. And my 19 year old drives the Red Explorer that I own. And she had rolled through a right on a red and I got the ticket, right? Sometimes when you look at this whole situation in life, you realize like parents, we just know better than our kids. We do. And at that moment in this story, I'm looking at this and I see that red, you know, right on red and I see that picture. I'm like, God, I get the story. Sometimes you just wanna wipe out all your kids and start over, right? Now seriously, here's the deal. Sometimes God does know better than we know. And here's what he knew. What God understood in this moment is it says that every inclination of humanity, every inclination of everyone, it says was only evil. That's the actual words, only evil all the time. And what God was looking at in this moment is what he sees is this increasing pandemic of evil, this just increasing evil that is happening. And in Genesis chapter six, early in the chapter, it even describes some of the evil and some of the people of renown, of violence and all the things that were going on and what God sees and what God had in mind was the big picture. And he says, if I don't put this roadblock of this flood right here, you and I wouldn't have a chance. You see, what God had in mind is God had you in mind. And what it came down to was this decision that we look and we say, how could God make that decision? And God looks at all of humanity and what he sees is his plan of redemption is actually in jeopardy. If God does not do something right here, and it, I'll give you that, it's, it's drastic, but if God does not do something right here, you and I do not have the opportunity for salvation. And so God pushed the reset button because he had you and me in mind. 
And what's interesting is that's what God understood and what God knew. But you have to see what God felt because so many people look at this story and they're like, man, God is a vengeful God. What God felt was not vengeance. What God felt was grief. There's nowhere in the story that it talks about God expressing his anger. What it says in the story is that God saw the evil man and it said he was deeply troubled. The word there for troubled is actually the word grieved. That he was grieved in his heart at what his creation had become. And he was grieved because he knew what he must do, but he knew what it meant. There's no place in the passage where it talks about God being angry, angry, that God is a short-tempered God that pulled the trigger on this decision. It says God was a broken-hearted God that saw a difficult decision that he had to make for the sake of you and me and the rest of humanity. And so God makes the decision to push the restart button. And he pushes the restart button with a man named Noah. And he restarts creation by preserving Noah and his family through the flood. And it's interesting, when you look at how he describes the people of the earth, every inclination, every thought in their mind was only evil all the time. Listen to how it describes Noah. Verse eight, it says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. So you have the description of wickedness, and then you have this man, Noah, and his family, and it describes Noah in just a few words. It says that he was righteous, meaning he was in right standing with God. He was blameless. There was no accusations that could be made about his character. In Hebrews chapter 11, it refers back to these verses, and it also says Noah was obedient even though he did not understand what was happening. And then the result of those things, it says that Noah walked with God. Interesting in scripture. There are only three other people in scripture that says actually walked physically with God. Adam, Enoch, Noah, and Abraham. Basically what scripture is describing Noah as, it's saying this was a guy whose GPS was set toward God. Like, even if he didn't understand what was going on, even if this story was going to be crazy, he was saying, I'm heading his direction because this is the best direction. And here's the thing you need to understand, that you're going to run into God when you point your life in his direction. You're going to run into God when you point your life in his direction. There's some of you saying, I just don't feel close to God. Well, you might want to question your direction. Like, when it comes to the areas of your life, are you headed in a direction that's pointing you toward running into God? Verse 8 says that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is very interesting. The word favor in the Hebrew and Greek language, it actually comes back to the same idea as grace. Grace is the most important theological idea in Scripture. And the whole plan of God What does the word grace mean? The big theological definition is this. It's unmerited favor. You may have heard that before. It basically means this. We receive something from God that we do not deserve. And here's the crazy thing about this passage. It says, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Other translations actually say, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the midst of everything that is happening, this guy who's righteous, who's blameless, who's obedient, who walked with God, he found grace. He received something from God that he did not deserve, which implies that Noah was not a perfect man. He was not a perfect man. He was a man who just had his direction set up on God. Now, if you track the story, if you know the story of Noah, or if you read to the end of it, you get to chapter 8 and chapter 9, and you see some interesting things. Noah gets off the boat, and he's off the boat about two days And we find the guy wasted, buck naked in his tent. And I would say this, if you were in the ark that long with that many people and that, you might might be drinking a little bit, right? But that's the thing. I mean, you just go to this story and there's so many good things. He's blameless, he's this and that. And then all of a sudden you have this moment, you're like, what happened, Noah? And all the story's trying to convey to us is, here's the thing. When we look at obedience, because it said that Noah was an obedient man, When we look at obedience, obedience is not about perfection. And I think that's so important for us to understand. Obedience is not about rule keeping. It's not about keeping all the laws that God has set out there. God's not looking for perfect people because if God was looking for perfect people, nobody would have survived the flood. Obedience is not about direction, or excuse me, about perfection. Obedience is about direction. 
Obedience is about the direction that we have set in our life is our direction headed toward God. You see, Noah walks with God not because he was perfect, but because he was headed in the same direction. God's not asking us to be perfect. He's just asking us to set our internal spiritual GPS in a direction that is headed toward God. And the reason is this. The reason is so he can lead us to his best for us. And I think it's interesting. This, I've been just playing with this idea and looking at this idea and thinking about it. You know, I grew up in, in a home where, man, we valued God's direction. And my parents taught me. I, I grew up, some of you didn't grow up in a, in a family that taught you God's direction and his commands and scripture. But I grew up in that. But for some reason for me, I kind of took that to the nth degree and began to see, well, it's about perfection and it's about keeping laws. But the problem with that is we get down the road and we can't even keep the standards that we set for ourselves, much less the standards we see in scripture. And you look at this idea and you say, well, God's not looking for perfection because every time we mess up, we look at God and we're like, oh man, I messed up again. God's not looking for perfection. He's looking for direction. It changes the game. It's something deeper than just rule keeping or law keeping. It's setting our direction on God in every area of our life and asking ourselves the question, does this decision take me closer to God or does it move me further away from God? It's a great way to look at our life. Like if you're a student, if you're a student in high school, you're a student in college, you're a single person, you start asking yourself the question, how do I manage my sexuality? Like when I look at this and I just look at how God's created us and the relationships that I have, how do I manage my sexuality? And when you focus on direction, you begin to ask the question, is this decision I'm making, is it getting me closer to God or is it creating more distance from God? And when we begin to set our direction on God in the area of our identity, in the area of sex and dating and marriage and all of those things, you experience more value and less regret. What you experience is what God wants to lead you to is his best. Like we experience God's best for us, but the temptation is this. The temptation, I, I've got a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old. Two girls that are just beautiful young ladies. And I watch their friends and I watch people that Grace goes to college with and my daughters and I watch even them. And sometimes they even have the question, they look at their mom, they're like, man, where are all the good guys out there? And the temptation for people that age or temptation for people, single people, or the temptation for married people that are not saying committed to their vows is to move off the direction of God and say, man, I just don't see anybody. And so what we do is we move toward a direction that's not his way. My wife's got a great line that she stole from somewhere else that she says to our girls. She said, girls, here's the deal. What you do in those situations, you put your head down and you head in God's direction and every once in a while you look up and see who's walking with you. And what happens is when we set our direction, our internal GPS on God, and we work on direction, not on perfection, what God does is he leads us to a better destination. When we set our direction on him, even when it doesn't make sense, he leads us to a better destination. We start asking ourselves the questions, like how do I manage my finances? Like, what do I do with my finances? And we look at things, and, and the natural part of our world is just to say, hey, we buy things for ourselves, um, we save a little bit, hopefully, we just kind of try to keep up with the Joneses, and hey, if there's a little bit left over at the end of the month, maybe, maybe we give and we're generous to something, somewhere. When you start asking God, hey, what direction would you have, go, have me go with my finances? It doesn't always make sense. Because you start saying, God, the numbers just don't add up. And you know this as well as I know this, if you're a generous person and you give to what God says to give to, you know that God's, God's math just doesn't add up. When it doesn't make sense, if you start going the direction of God, what you begin doing is you begin flipping the script, you change your direction, you say, I'm gonna give first. And then I'm gonna manage my finances where I'm gonna live on a portion of the rest of that, okay? I'm gonna live on the, I'm gonna give first, I'm gonna save second, and then I'm gonna live on a portion of the rest of those things. And what you end up seeing is that God's direction leads you to a better destination. We start asking the question of how do we manage our relationships? John 13, 34 says, a new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. A, a different direction leads to a better destination. 
We start saying, how do I manage my reputation? Man, God's direction leads to a better destination. And I think we've got to start asking ourselves this question of even when things don't make sense, is our direction pointed toward God? Is your spiritual GPS set in God's direction? He's not asking you to be perfect. He has grace for you when you're not. But he wants us to point our direction toward him. Now, here's the interesting thing about the story is that God's direction does lead us to a better destination. But you know as well as I do, and especially in this story, that sometimes his direction just doesn't make sense in the process. If we go all the way to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, Hebrews chapter 11 just brings out all these hall of fame people throughout the biblical narrative. The writer of Hebrews, he talks about Abraham and he talks about some other people and he talks about Noah and he says this, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and received the righteousness that comes by faith. I want you to think about this for a moment. I'm gonna read the beginning of that verse for us again. It says, it was by faith Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. Think about this for a second. God comes down and talks to Noah and he says, Noah, I want you to build a boat. Now understand, the size of the boat that he communicated that he wanted Noah to build was 450 feet long. It was 75 feet wide. It was 50 feet tall. If you just take the actual dimensions and square footage that would have been in this boat, that is the square footage and the size of our Frederick campus. Like if you're from out of state, you're watching online, you're sitting here at Niwot, you can see a picture on a screen of the Frederick campus. That's the size of boat that Noah was supposed to build. The passage goes on and it says, God says, hey Noah, I want you to build a boat. The the size of the boat's not the kicker. Here's the kicker. He says, he asked him to build a boat and asked him to obey things that he didn't even understand. What didn't he understand? Here's the thing. Scripture says earlier in the passage, it says that the, the world was watered from the waters below. It was actually moisture came up from the ground. So it had never rained before. So what you're looking at a situation here is that Noah is being asked by God to build a boat that's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 50 feet high, in a place where it has never, in a desert where it has never rained before. Like, imagine this with me. Like, you're Noah, and people are coming up to you, and they're like, hey, Noah, what you building? And Noah's going, I'm building a boat because it's going to rain. And they're going, you're building a what? Because it's going to what? Like people had no idea what's going on here. And Noah, in the moment, what Noah did is Noah obeyed God even though the story made no sense to him at all. And here's the thing for us. There are so many times in life where God asks us to do some things and in the moment, because we cannot see the future, we look at it with him and we say, God, I don't know if I'm gonna do that because it doesn't make sense. And a lot of times it's just the inclination in our mind that we're like, This doesn't feel right. And God, I don't know if I want to go through with this. I don't know if I want to stand up for this. I don't know if I want to put this kind of work into this thing. I don't know if I have the discipline to do this because, God, I just just don't understand what you're actually asking me to do. God looked at Noah and he said, I want you to build a boat. And for Noah, obedience was this. It was building a boat even though he didn't understand why. Obedience for Noah was building a boat even though it was gonna take him 75 years to build this boat. Obedience was building a boat when nobody else was building a boat. Obedience was building a boat when everybody else was questioning what he was doing because they'd never even seen rain before. Obedience was building a boat when Noah's looking at it saying, man, the reward for this is years in the future. God's not asking you to build a boat, but he is asking you to do something. And obedience for you and me is obeying even when it doesn't make sense. 
It's obeying even when nobody else is doing it. It's obeying even if everybody else is saying, what are you doing? Obedience is obeying God and setting our direction on him, not being perfect, but setting our direction on him, even when we're looking at it and saying, man, I don't even know if I see a potential reward from this right now. And what is God asking you to do to set your direction on him even if it doesn't make sense right now? Here's the interesting thing ob- about obedience. Stephen Furtick, he's a famous pastor of Elevation Church and, and he, he's got this great line. He talks about the idea that, that great acts of God are preceded by simple acts of obedience. I want you to think about that for a second. Great acts of God in our lives are usually preceded by simple acts of obedience. And I get what you're doing right there. Right now, you're looking at this story of Noah and you're going, Sean, come on. The story of Noah is not a simple act of obedience. Like we just talked about 450 feet and 75 feet and 50 feet tall. And we're talking about 75 years to build this thing. That's not a simple act of obedience. But here's the way we look at life most of the time. We look at life all the way down the road to the end instead of looking at it from the beginning. We look at the story of Noah. Here's how this thing goes. God comes down to Noah and he says, hey Noah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build a boat. Let me explain it to you. I'm sure that he explained a little more than actually happened in scripture, like we have written down in scripture. He explains to Noah, I want you to build this boat. Guys, the first act of obedience was probably Noah going back into his three sons and saying, hey guys, I got a project tomorrow. They're like, dad, what's the project? And he's like, well, you'll see. And the first thing Noah probably did is take his sons out, grab an ax and chop down a tree. And nobody knew Noah was building a boat. And he chopped down another tree and another tree and he started forming some wood planks and he began to build something and probably like a year or two later, somebody's walking by and going, hey, what's Noah building over there? And by that time, Noah and his sons, they're already in because one simple act of obedience led to another simple act of obedience and set this direction toward building this ark. And guess what? Those simple acts of obedience added up and added up and added up until there was an ark that was there. And then it started raining, and it all made sense to Noah. And you and me in our lives, there are so many times we look at God and we're like, God, I don't understand. I don't get this in my relationships. I don't get this in my finances. I don't understand. This is hard. Like usually what God asks us to do, there are so many times in my life, especially in my 20s, that I'm going, dude, I know better. There are times in my 30s I'm like, dude, I don't know better. I'm pretty stupid, but I really don't know what, and I don't understand this whole thing. And you're just trying to figure out. In my 40s, I'm like, okay, God does know best, and we got to head this direction. And I get to this point now, and I'm like, I think God's direction is best, and I'm beginning to realize by looking back over time to see all the little things that he's done through acts of obedience and also acts of stupidity where God's rerouted me and said, man, that act right there, that thing, it's not the right direction. Let's go this direction. But all of that brings you to this moment in time and you look at it and you say, it's really true. Simple acts of obedience are so much better. And they compound up into these things that God wants to do. The great things he wants to do in our life are usually because we have set our direction back here on him, even when it didn't make sense. And guys, Noah's not the only one. You take Joshua, like Joshua in the story of Jericho. Joshua's getting ready. God said, hey, I want you to, you come away from, you know, Egypt and you walk through the desert for 40 years. Now it's time to go into this land. I promised you Canaan and I'm gonna give that to you. And here's the first thing you gotta do is you gotta fight against Jericho, this massive city that's got 30 foot tall walls and 12 foot wide walls around it, big enough for chariots to run around the top. And Joshua's like, okay, God, I believe you can do this. I've seen some good things, so give me the battle plan. And God's like, here's the battle plan. I want you to walk around, take all your thousands of soldiers, and I want you to tell them to walk around Jericho once a day for six days. Don't say anything, just be quiet. They're gonna ridicule you. Don't say anything, that's the plan. He's okay, okay, what's the seventh day? The seventh day, I want you to walk around seven times. And when you get to that seventh time, here's what you do. And he's like, are we charging? He's like, no, you're not charging. Here's what you're gonna do. Somebody's gonna blow the trumpet and everybody's gonna scream and yell at the wall. 
And Joshua's like, okay, God, I guess I'll go tell him that. But that is like the dumbest battle plan I've ever heard in my life. Unless, did you realize what geologists say? Do you know that the city of Jericho is built on a massive fault line? We're talking like San Andreas Fault. And do you know what historians say? That there was a massive earthquake at the same time, around the same time, and the same place as Jericho and the biblical story? You see, sometimes what God is asking us to do is he's asking us simply to set our direction toward him and obey because he's got a plan that's so much bigger than we could actually imagine. And what we do is we obey even if it doesn't make sense. And it gives God an opportunity to act, to act on our behalf. You see, obedience is not about perfection. Obedience is about direction. And there are so many places in scripture where God says to people, if you will just follow my direction, I will lead you to a better destination that is my best for you. And what it takes for you and me is the willingness to trust, trust and ask the question when we run into those situations, is this decision gonna take me closer to God or is it gonna move me further away from God? I think there's a lot of times in life where we kind of look at our life and we're like, man, I messed that up and we're just kind of buzzing down the road and, and we know that God's saying, hey, you, you should probably head this direction. But we just blow right through that GPS and we just head on and, and here's the interesting thing about God. Like if you're just kind of coming to faith and checking out faith, you need to understand this, that God's not an angry God. When I go back to that story at the beginning and I buzz past that first turn and, and it said reroute, it, my GPS did not like scream and yell at me. Like it didn't do that. It, just, it didn't say, hey, you idiot, like take the U-turn in 500 feet. I told you the direction to go. It just said rerouting. It just said, hey, take a U-turn 500 feet. Let's head that direction. Did I do it? No. <laughs> and so I buzz past that and it gets to the next place and it just simply says, hey, take a left here. Or take it right here. And that's the way God is with us out of his great compassion. Out of the fact that he has you in mind, he just consistently through other people, through impressions on our mind, through scripture, through mentors that try to teach us, through parents that try to say, hey, don't do that. Through all kinds of things in our life, he just tries to gently reroute us toward his best for us. God did it with Noah through a flood. And then after that flood, it says that they got off the ark and they sacrificed to God and God made a covenant with a rainbow that said, every time you see this rainbow, you will realize that I love you, that I've made a covenant with you, and I will never do something like this again. He did it with Moses as he took the people out of Egypt and Moses came to the Red Sea and he put his staff over the Red Sea and God parted the waters and they walked through and he took them on a journey. It took a while, but he took them on a journey to the promised land to give them a land for themselves. And he did it at the cross. The ultimate covenant act of God where he sent Jesus to take care of our sins. The places where we've misdirected our lives and where he just said, hey, at the cross, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take care of those sins. I'm gonna reroute humanity. And I'm gonna give you a chance that if you place your faith in Jesus, you can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And then he started the church and that's why we're here today. And I just wanna encourage each and every one of us today that when God talks about obedience, what he is saying, he's saying you don't have to be perfect. Jesus was, he took care of that. What you just have to do is set your direction on me. And if you are a person that's sitting here saying, man, I've never placed my direction on Jesus, on the cross, and said, I want him to be my savior, all you have to simply do is pray and ask God to forgive your sins and be the leader of your life. That he would set your direction, that you set your internal GPS on him. We pray, we ask for that, and then we schedule our baptism. And we mark that moment and we say, God, because of my faith, I'm following you and I know you are forgiving me and you're directing my life. And for the rest of us, here's what we do. We set our direction on God and every day we say, God, is this getting me closer or this, is this pushing me further away from you? Direction is what obedience is. We're not talking about perfection. Let's set our direction on him. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful. We are so grateful for your son, Jesus. God, we're thankful for his love for us and, 
And God, even in these hard stories, we, we do see that you had the greater picture in mind for us. You had us in mind. And Father, every single day of our life, you've got us in your mind and you are trying to route us toward the best destination for our lives. And God, I pray that this week, what we would do is we'd just set our GPS on you and we'd ask that question, am I getting closer or further away from God? God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for forgiveness. I pray, Father, that the person who does not know you, Father, I pray they'd set your direction on you. And Father, for the rest of us, Help us just to remember that that direction leads to a better destination, even if it doesn't make sense. God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Church, good to be with you today. And I just want to encourage you, man, this week, let's remember, let's ask God the question, does this lead me closer to him or does it lead me further away from him? You guys have an awesome week. We'll see you next Sunday.